welcome to Your Family Dog, a podcast dedicated to helping families love living with dogs. Here are your hosts, Julie Fudge-Smith and Colleen Pilar. Hi, and welcome back to Your Family Dog. I'm Julie Fudge-Smith, and I'm here, of course, as always, with Colleen Pilar. And today, we have a special guest, Eileen Anderson. She is a writer and a dog trainer. She writes the very well-known Eileen and Dogs blog, which Colleen and I have referenced, I don't know how many times on this podcast, and uh, which has been featured on the Freshly Pressed by WordPress.com and won the award the Academy Applause in 2014 from the Academy of Dog Trainers, an enviable award to get. Her articles and training videos have been incorporated into curricula worldwide and translated into several languages. Eileen started a website for canine cognitive dysfunction in 2013 which has become a major resource for pet owners whose dogs have dementia. And she has published a wonderful book on the subject that was in 2015. The book won a Maxwell Award from the Dog Writers Association of America in 2017. And the book is called Remember Me, Loving and Caring for a Dog with Canine Cognitive Dysfunction. And we will put a link not only to her website on canine cognitive dysfunction, but for her book as well. Because if you have a dog that is getting older, be well worth the read. Because even if your dog doesn't develop canine cognitive dysfunction, there's lots of wonderful things in here about making the quality of life <clears throat> for any dog, but especially an older dog, better. And that's what we're always aiming for, is to make the life of our dogs better. So welcome, Eileen. We're so glad you're here and joining us on Your Family Dog. Thank you so much, Julie and Colleen. I'm really, really glad to be here. We're excited Super. to have you. Um, I have a question about how common canine cognitive dysfunction is. Do you have any idea? It's a lot more common than anybody knows. Um, there have been a lot of studies of it. You know, so many people haven't even heard of it. And I hadn't, of course, before my little dog got it. But it's up to like one out of three when dogs get in the very age of really? their lives. Yeah, mm. it's, it's, you know, it's maybe like eight or 10 percent when they're 10 or 11 years old but it just goes up from there and it's a lot more common than people think that is more common than i realized yeah, yeah me too what about with like with larger dogs who don't live to nine or ten is is there any disproportionate amount of canine cognitive dysfunction in longer lived dogs or that's a great question i read about that on and off um and i think at first i misunderstood what i read but it's common in all breeds. All breeds get it, but because it is age-related, a bigger dog is more likely to pass from something else or have another disease or problem happen to it before. But it can happen to any breed. It just depends on how long they live. Okay. And does it, um, does it come on sometimes in spurts, or is it just a gradual thing? And the reason I ask this is because my... Um, sister's nine-year-old golden retriever had a day a week ago where he wandered off into a part of the house where nobody was and nobody was expected to be and then found himself barking in this room uh -huh. a couple of times and sort of that was our thought was like oh and then since then he's done really well but he had i think three times he had just found himself in the ping pong room all alone and calling <laughs> for help Hello, I'm in the ping pong room oh. and no one's here with me. So um, I am not a vet, blah, blah, blah. But that was sort of my first thought was like, oh, we're, we're seeing some signs. Does that fit a little bit with some of what you've seen and heard? First, I have to say, I'm not a vet. Um, <laughs> and I'm answering as a lay person who's talked to a lot of people whose dogs have had this condition. I hear this every once in a while. That's all I can say. And of course, there are other conditions that can cause any of these symptoms. And it usually, you know, merits a vet visit because some of them do come on faster than canine cognitive dysfunction. Mm -hmm. I have heard of sometimes it happening as a result of a trauma, you know, an injury, mm -hmm. a fall. And it, you know, our brains are so sensitive and so are our dogs. And yeah. who knows how all that works. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the answer to your question is, Maybe. <laughs> it depends. That's our favorite answer here. Yeah, it depends. Right. Well, be. it depends. Yes. <laughs> right. um, well, I was also going to ask, that brings up my next question, which is if your dog does is diagnosed with canine cognitive dysfunction, 
do other illnesses have a dramatic effect upon it? I know when my, my mother had um, a dementia and when she would get like a urinary tract infection or something, you could just see if she was I'm making up numbers here, folks, um, if she was, you know, going along in an eight and she got a mm-hmm. urinary tract infection, she may drop down to a you know a functioning level of five. But when it was over, she never bounced back to an eight. You know, she maybe uh-huh. got back to a six or a seven. So mm-hmm. we found that not only did she not have the reserves to handle any kind of physical malady, even as small as a cold, but it really took a toll and she would never bounce back completely. And I didn't know if that was typical of dementia in dogs or not. In my experience, yes. Um, definitely the, the more things that happen, you know, the harder it makes on the dog. I tell the story in my book of how I thought I was going to have to euthanize my little dog because she got a scratch on her retina, something that small. She, it wasn't so much coping with it, um, you know, the pain or the drops or anything, but she couldn't cope with having a big collar on. You know, she, she was too mixed up already. Her balance wasn't good. She got stuck places. She, it would have been a terrible unkindness for her to have to live in one of those for one or two weeks. And luckily I found a smaller collar that she was able to tolerate. But yes, you know, anything's going to get complicated if your brain already just can't keep up with what's going on. Right. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about Cricket and what happened with her and how, how she inspired this whole process? <laughs> well, she was a great little dog. Um, and she inspired this process well, in a couple of ways, but mostly because we struggled to get her diagnosed. And a lot of that's my own fault. A lot of it is just because this disease is so unknown to so many people. Uh, there wasn't a lot of information out there. I didn't tell the right things to my vet. Um, but she, her first symptom was anxiety. And she got scared of one of our dear friends, somebody that she'd known as long as I'd had her and just loved. She got scared of her all of a sudden. And looking back, now I know that that was likely the first, that was the onset of the uh, canine cognitive dysfunction. But it was a year later before I really, there were enough symptoms that I thought, oh, tell the vet about this too, you know? And I didn't want, she's such a great little dog and such a trooper. And she still had a good life after the dementia, but I just didn't want anybody else to have that kind of delay. Mm-hmm. You know, there are right. other, everybody loves their dogs, you know, and there are other many other wonderful dogs out there. I don't want them to have those delays like Cricket did. Right. And the other thing about it is, is with most illnesses, the earlier the diagnosis, the more treatable it is. Now, one thing to remember, and, and you make very clear in the book, is that canine cognitive dysfunction is not curable. There's no cure for this, but there are treatments and there are new treatments coming along all the time including medications and and diet. And this is something you need to talk with your vet about what's going on um, and not something that we can cover in the scope of this podcast. Uh, but know that there are treatments. The earlier you get this diagnosed, the more likely those treatments are to be effective in delaying the progress of the disease, but certainly will not cure it. That's right. Um, Don't you have a list of uh, symptoms that people can take a look at when they're trying to decide what's going on? I do. It's on the website, uh, dogdementia.com. It's downloadable as a PDF. And here's where I also say, I'm not a vet. Neither are you (laughs) out there. All you people out there on the Internet, right? We can't (laughs) diagnose our own dogs. I put the list out there as a service because everybody's looking for one. But the purpose of the list is to go down, check the boxes, take it straight to your vet. Right. And I agree with that. And, and one another thing that might be useful for people so that in case the diagnosis comes in that it's not canine cognitive dysfunction, Dr. Alicia Karras of Tufts University gave us the comfort diary. 
and yeah. which you can record how your dog is doing in various aspects over a course of a week. And we've found that to be very useful. And that could be used in conjunction with the right. symptoms list mm-hmm. to give exactly. your, your vet a much more comprehensive view of what's actually going on with your dog and help them to be able to more accurately diagnose the problem. So what we'd highly yeah. recommend, we'll put a, we'll put a link to our, to Dr. Karras's comfort diary as well, because that would be a nice uh, uh, yeah. in conjunction. And if I may say, you know, that's also what helps people know what is helping in terms of intervention. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, we all yes. have these cognitive biases where, you know, you give your dog this, you think they're getting better because you want them to be better. And that's, mm-hmm. that's how our brains work. Keeping a diary will really help you be more objective to know whether something's really improving or not. Yes. Right. So, Journaling is great. Yeah, I, I had a friend who called me whose dog was not doing well, and I said, um, "What?" I, first thing I said was, I am not a vet. <laughs> I am a dog trainer, uh, but I do have this comfort diary. And I suggest that if you don't think she's in really serious pain or terrible distress, fill this out for a week. It's going to give you a much better idea about where she actually is. And she found that to be really useful because it made her realize, oh, things are not as bad as I thought in most okay. areas. And, and other areas, and yeah, they aren't as good as I would like them to be. So, I mean, it right. can be very useful. Um, so, one of the things that you did, you talked about some really terrific ways to um, manage a dog with mm-hmm. canine cognitive dysfunction. Um, you had you, you need to consider changing your household around a little bit. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so Might as well plan ahead. <laughs> <'Cause you're> gonna, <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> things that you thought were most effective or changing your household to make it manageable for the dog, but livable for you too. Right. I made a safe room for Cricket because I couldn't always be home. And I needed a place where she could be without hurting herself, but without being completely confined. She was crate trained, but I mean, not all day or not for even, you know, three hours while I went to work. So I made an area in my house that was literally gated off with exercise pens um, is everybody familiar with those of your listeners? You think they're yeah, they're they're like a pen, but it's it's it can be open ended. It's six sided. You can fold it out or you can curve it around to create a pen. I can put a link to it on Amazon on the yeah. Website. They they I, really help. Of course, right. there's there are always other issues like you know make sure that it's not of a gauge where your dog can get their foot stuck in it. That that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Anyway, I did use those kind of pens to gate off part of my front room and that the part I gated off was furniture because I had found out that she could walk over like the rung in the bottom of a chair and get stuck there. Mm -hmm. I mean, even something as fine as a chair could be a danger to her. So she had her little safe room that was gated all around Uh, the whole floor. I have hardwood floors through my house, which I love, but we're not good for her. (laughs) Um, the whole floor was covered with either yoga mats, um, foam-backed bath mats, some carpets that were were very uh, non-skiddy. You know, they didn't slide around. Um, things that were easy to clean because uh, she pooped pretty indiscriminately. Um, and I'm trying to think. The, the most important part, she also had a place to wander. Um, she was a wanderer. She didn't seem to be distressed when she wandered around, but there was a long hall. And so I included that in her space so she could walk up and down the hall, which is what she did. Um, Another feature of her room is that I had a webcam that I could use to peek in on her when I was not there. And I knew, you know, if she was, oops, she went to the bathroom, she's going to track around in it. Time to get home if I possibly can. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. Now, her pacing was not distressing to her, if I remember correctly from the book, but other dogs, you need to, okay, if if we're pacing, if this is a super tight circle and we're heading, you know, we're just always going counterclockwise in a super tight circle, this might be something that needs to be addressed. Whereas if your dog is just sort of pacing, it may not be a distressful kind of thing, but that's another thing you need to talk to your vet about, is if your dog is in constant motion. And, um, I imagine that for some dogs, pacing may be at night, and that's going to be an issue for people. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's a huge issue for people. It's amazing how often that's what comes up. In your book, you have an acronym, DISHA, that mm-hmm. kind of breaks down the five categories of things people might look for. 
Are you ready for the quiz? Can you tell us what DISHA stands for? Because if not, I can totally read it off and then you can elaborate. Because Why didn't you do that? I, I Let me do that for you. Okay. Kind of, so D. I can also tell you what's not on there. <laughs> okay. D is disorientation. I is interactions with people and other pets that have changed. S is sleep-wake alterations. H is house soiling. And A is activity level alterations. And you actually just covered a lot of those in talking about what was happening with cricket in the various aspects of that. But I think there are pieces in here that people might not initially think of as being canine cognitive dysfunction. So do you have any thoughts about that you'd like to share? I do. The one that starts with I, um, interactions, that can be interactions with your household members, um, other dogs, cats, people, strange people. A lot falls under that. And that's the one that I missed. You know, it was right there in front of us. She got scared of my friend. That's I in, in the disha right there and it's it's an easy one to miss um something the activity levels you know the the stuff of the dog doing a lot of stuff at night that's just a killer that is so hard on families Mm -hmm. um and that is something that vets can often help with with some kind of medications um but i know that that we were pretty blessed she pretty much stayed still at night i mean when she woke up i woke up you know in a second because i was going to have to see what was going on but uh, I do want to mention, you know, DISHA is how they start, first started categorizing things, I think, in the 1990s. And what's not on DISHA actually is one of the most important things, which is memory. Mm-hmm. They forget. Ah. <laughs> and learning, you know, they can't learn new things well at all. And in the later stages, not at all. You know, the, the short-term memory loss, just, just like people with Alzheimer's. Yeah. So it should be DISHAM. <laughs> yeah, dish ham. Dish ham. <laughs> okay. Well, we I love the 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 mention of the yoga mats and the rubber back mats because I have suggested that for clients whose dogs are recovering from surgery and they're a little unstable or, you know, that that um, then the beauty of that is that you can orient those in, in whatever room you're in or however you want the dog to to move through the household. So we have found that yoga mats and rubber backed mats are really useful just in managing dogs in general, especially dogs who have been ill. Yes. I have something to add to that, which is I have an ongoing experiment in my house, which is that you could buy um, special plasticine things for your stairs that are, you know, keep stairs from being slippery. But they are clear, and so that on. If you like your wood stairs, you know you can still see the stairs. I, my ongoing experiment is that I put one on my hardwood floor, about it was while Cricket was still alive. It was probably three or four years ago to see if it would damage the floor. It has not. Um, so that's another option. Some of the things that you can get for basically you buy them for covering stairs, mm-hmm. but they are clear, okay. and you can still see your floors through them, and that can help some people who you know. The downside is that, you know, if, if you have a patchwork of mats and rugs and things, the dog can trip sometimes. Mm-hmm. Now, in, enrichment, people think, well, well my, my dog's in his memory. What, what do you mean by enrichment? Why is this important? But it turns out that a lot of studies have shown that the same thing with humans. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. Mm-hmm. So can you talk a little bit about some of the enrichment things that you can do for a dog with dementia? Sure. Um, Most of them are toned down, you know, less intense versions of things we hope we would be doing with our dogs anyway. Um, I had given Cricket a little walk down the street every day of her life. She got so she couldn't do that. Um, She couldn't walk on a leash because she kept making left turns, as we call it. Um, And she just didn't have the wherewithal to cope with that. But instead, she had a wander in my front yard just about every day. Well, every day because I took her out to potty and she was um, so lame in the hind end by that time. I didn't have to worry about her running off, but she still got the enrichment of getting to explore a little bit, to see new things, smell new things. I've read that smell is one of the last things to go. And certainly with her, she was interested in smells to the very end. So instead of a big long walk, we had a wander in the front yard. 
Um, she had used food toys before. Um, I, I hope, I bet your listeners are familiar with some of them, you know, Kongs and things that you knock around to get food out of. You have to make them easier as the dog loses their mental capacity. Um, I found that puppy toys are just about perfect, things that are really easy for the dog to do. And, you know, I have some videos of Cricket still kind of knocking a, knocking a toy around on the ground and getting, getting things out of it. Um, and bringing things to the house that they can't go out and get anymore um, and smells. Anything. And it, the funny thing is that you think of, well, you know, maybe it needs to be the odor of deer or, you know, we think of these exotic things. Anything has a smell. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of my favorite things is just, you know, to put a bag of groceries on the floor and even if there was no meat in there, the dog's always interested. Mm-hmm. You know, they want to stick their head in there and see. And I just got in the habit of anything I brought in the house. My sweater, if I'd gone to a new store or something, I'd take my sweater off and put it down and let Cricket sniff it. That, she was a pretty sniffy little dog, and dogs all differ. But that was a big one for her. Just a little, a little small bit of novelty, you know, mm-hmm. something new that she could cope with and that was a little bit interesting to her. Way back when, I remember a dog trainer, Patty Russo, talking about how smell is so powerful for dogs and how they really love it, and that um, she would just like grab a leaf off the ground and turn to her dog and go, look, I found a leaf. And her dog would be like, awesome. And the funny thing is I've done that so many times with something really small, nothing particularly Uh special, but it's this sort of shared discovery. Like, this is the most awesome stick I've ever seen. What do you think? And the dog is like, that is interesting let me sniff it all like not not the most awesome of all time but apparently colleen really likes it so that whole idea of you know it's just interaction and fun and and just a little yeah. bit of of here's something for you to to notice something mm-hmm. and so bringing home your groceries and saying check out that bag <laughs> actually i think edza would be delighted if i would start that practice right now <laughs> Yeah, I had a dog who did that once. Put his head inside a paper bag and scratched his cornea. Uh oh, so, oh, <laughs> so we're back to um, that. <laughs> yes, so um, what, but it turns out actually he had dry eye. So I mean, it just was. Uh, I'm not sure he would have scratched it if he hadn't had dry eye. But so it sort of led to a further diagnosis. So um, just be aware of, of paper bags. They can if the dog can scratch his eye on a cornea, <laughs> his cornea. cornea. Um, so just to add, be a Debbie Downer there. Um, it reminds me of, we had a Zazie Todd on and she talked about making happy dogs happier. And she talked about taking your dogs out on a sniffari every day. And so what I was thinking about is this is a modified sniffari. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a sniffari that's appropriate for your dog, which could also be if your dog is recovering from like knee surgery, it's the same kind of thing. You can still bring him a bag of groceries to put his head in and not scratch his cornea and sniff. And uh, so these are all things that can be applied in other situations as well. It's the Netflix have... version. It's the travel documentary. Instead of going <laughs> on the safari, you sit on your couch and you see all the things. So, you know. <laughs> right. Netflix yeah. safari. Yeah. I like that. I have, have another one. thing about I have another thing about that which is I was so blessed that Cricket went to my office with me just about every day. And riding in a crate in the car, I'm pretty sure, helped her balance over the long term. She was a small dog. You know, if I had been a reckless driver, she would have been knocked around a lot. And hopefully she wasn't. But just sitting in a car, having to make those little compensatory movements with Mm -hmm. your core muscles, I think that counted for a lot with her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These days I would... I would do exercises, you know, these days I would do exercises, you know, there's a great course out there for older dogs now, Uh, but uh, back then I hadn't thought of that, but I think she got some good exercise of not only her, her muscles, but her, whatever it is in your head that keeps your balance, you know, I think that helped. Yeah. The vestibular system, right? Yes, it is the vestibular system. Um, Well, when our dog Rebel, he had myeloid degeneration, he could sit, but he couldn't walk my husband would put him in the wagon and take Uh him from from the neighborhood in the wagon and he loved that because he could you know get all the breezes and stuff like that so that would be something else as long as the wagon wasn't scary for the dog right right, you need to be careful of noises sudden noises that the the rattling along the sidewalk might be but as long as it's comfortable for the dog and maybe even in the earlier stages I mentioned it's a way in which your dog can get out and see the world a little bit more 
you had um what I really loved and I and been, I have to go out and buy a muffin tin because where I'm living right now I don't have a muffin tin you had this great one for retrievers which I adored which is you put a treat in the bottom of the muffin tins and then you put tennis balls on top of them and <laughs> they have to take the tennis balls off to find the treat and I was like that's a great idea especially for someone like my Zuzu who just she she likes challenges but they can't be too hard because then exactly. I just shut down because mm-hmm. you know I'm just I'm, I'm not all Zuzi Zuzi is very sweet but she th- things like that she can get easily like I don't understand what you want me to do so I need to make it easy enough for her mm-hmm. to find it to be fun and that seemed like a great one, a muffin tin and um, tennis ball game. Mm-hmm. So, um, mm-hmm. go ahead, Tommy. So, Eileen, what, what tips do you have for helping your dog with canine cognitive dysfunction deal with other pets in the household and vice versa, helping the other pets? Or maybe it's not helping them deal with yeah, one another. Yeah, for us, it was largely strategies. management. Um, I had, at the, at the time, three other dogs. Um, Cricket was 12 pounds and my youngest dog was a puppy when she came and she ended up at 40 pounds. And so as soon as she cracked adolescence, you know, she was not around Cricket. And interestingly enough, I developed a habit in her of avoidance and they, they never interacted and they just never did. And so she was safe around her later in life. She would just walk on by her like she wasn't there, which is you know, it's sad in our heads, but it was absolutely the safest situation. Um, I had one dog that was actively unfriendly to Cricket, and they never were in the same space together. And I have a really nice little dog. Luckily, <laughs> I had a nice one, a nice little hound mix who was 18 pounds and never hurt anybody in her life. And she hung out with Cricket. They weren't buddies, but I think it's always nice if a dog can be with another dog just, you know, for their species <laughs> being yeah. together. And so they were yeah. safe together, and I let that happen. But there was a lot of management, a lot of, you know, closing doors and closing gates and just being careful because she was little. She was vulnerable. Her back legs didn't work very well. She was easy to knock down. And she didn't lose her feistiness to the end. You know, I realized belatedly that part of the reason that my big lug of a dog avoided her is that she was giving her the dirty terrier look. (laughs) It's like, don't mess with me. And Clara never did. (laughs) Well, I think that's where it's really important, once again, to understand dog body language, to understand both Cricket's body language um, that may have gone from feisty to fearful. Mm-hmm. And to understand the other dog saying, um, you know, I just as soon avoid. So can you make this easy for me too? Right. So I think being really cognizant of dog body language is going to, to give you a lot of guidance as to how this should be handled. Yes. And, and you're right. And to take that step back and realize, hold on a second here. I, I can't anthropomorphize this. I can't say, oh, this is really a travesty. Maybe it's not. Maybe the travesty is if you try to force relationships that shouldn't be. Yeah. A lot of people don't want to separate their dogs. And I understand mm-hmm. that, you know, I think, I too. you know, but once I got one that was aggressive, I thought this is not okay. You know, the, these dogs can live in the same household, but they're yeah. not going to be at liberty with each other. And we managed just fine. You know, they both had good lives. Just good. had to get over myself. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that's what we have to do. But I think when we come back down to they both had good lives, that's always the key. That sometimes the good life isn't the picture exactly. that we had in mind in the beginning. But if we can go, this is a different picture, but it's still a good life. Yeah, I think that's a great way to funny. put it, Colleen. I think it really is. Um, one of the things that you do deal with in the book, and you have three stories about um, euthanasia. And mm-hmm. I thought it was a very effective chapter. Um, one of the things that really struck me was something that that we've talked a little bit about but the idea of putting it in your will or talking to someone making sure that there's a codicil or something that says if i go first this is what needs to be done with my with my dogs and for cricket you had made the decision that if you were to die before her she needed to be put to sleep you want to talk about that just a little bit yeah i'm happy to it you know if someone first hears that it might sound like an ego trip. It was the opposite of that. Um, it was not about me. It was about the fact that I was the only person she knew anymore. She had gotten afraid of the other people she used to know. 
and she would have had no anchor in life. She, to the end of her life, she knew me. She would seek me out. She'd come up and put her little nose on my leg and make sure it was me, you know, with, with that good little sniffer. And I was her anchor. So I did make that decision, as sad as it is, that if if I were to die, that she needed to be humanely put to sleep because she would not have any quality of life. She, When, when they're that far into dementia, they can't learn things. So that they can't right. learn that a new person loves them. They can't learn that this new space... They can't find their way around. You know, she would not be able to function in any kind of changed life. And that's why I did that. Yeah. And and I thought that was very wise. Um, a heart-wrenching decision to yes. have to make, but but truly a wise one and something I just wanted to bring up that these are the kinds of things that, that you perhaps need to be thinking about, um, yeah. unfortunately. Um, so, Colleen, um, is there anything else that you would like to ask Eileen about that we have missed that I have missed and you haven't missed because you know you don't miss as many things as I miss <laughs> <laughs> well actually I think we've wrapped it up pretty well because uh, we've got a whole breadth of discussion here and it is. Eileen's book is fantastic so if you have any any thoughts that you might be dealing with this or just knowing that you know one in three older dogs deals with it that's pretty much all of us as dog owners are going to experience parts of this at various points in our lives so we'll have that in the show notes and stuff and i'm really just so grateful i am I too because i think this is a really important topic and i think that it doesn't have to be quite as devastating as it may initially sound and that's what i yes. found and i wanted to really bring out about this book is that it is it provides a great deal of useful and encouraging information so that you realize that that we can still have a good life it may not be the life we envision but it can be a really nice life to the end. So thank you so much for taking the time to, to meet with us and for writing this book, because I think it's one <laughs> that everybody should be aware of. So thank you, you are, so much for joining us. You're very welcome. And so thank you so much for having me. All right. Thanks for listening to Your Family Dog. Got questions? Interesting ideas? Colleen and Julie would love to hear them. Call 614-349-1661 or visit www.yourfamilydogpodcast.com to share your thoughts.